I'm E.G. Marshall. Tell me the truth. Are you sensitive, impressionable, tender-hearted? Squeamish, maybe? Are your sensibilities easily offended? Are you fussy or persnickety? If you are all or any of these things, perhaps you had better not listen to what follows, for the tale we are going to tell you is aptly called A Horror Story. Our mystery drama, A Horror Story, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Robert Dryden. about to hear as dreadful a tale as has ever been told, appalling in its frightfulness. So pause a moment. Think hard whether you're able to endure it. If you have qualms about listening, turn to something sweet and soothing. But I urge you to gather your courage and listen. Nothing on the first floor, nothing on the second. Only the third floor remains to be explored. Uh, mm, why do I bother? Why do I persist? Well, if anyone cares, this place fascinates me. Has for 20 years. Ever since I first came to New Orleans in 1829 and saw a crowd of frightened people gathered outside this building on Common Street. Mm, by eavesdropping among them, I learned that they thought the place haunted by a collection of gruesome ghosts. Now, let's see what's in here. Oh, I declare if the third floor yields no more than the other two, I... Ooh, I say, what an exquisite fireplace. So delicate. Pure Adam. As a world traveler, I've become something of a connoisseur. Still, you... Oh, what's this? Looks like a loose brick in the chimney breast. Oh, really, the town should take better care of... Let's see if I can pry it loose. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, why are people so neglectful? Oh. Still, no one comes here anymore. They're too frightened, I suppose. Imagine being afraid of ghosts. <laughs> uh-huh. Got it. Good. Now, what may I find here? What could there be in the space behind the... Oh, oh, yes. There's something. Yes, yes, yes. There's a... A, a little book. A little book bound in... Red Morocco leather. And that... Wait, what have we here? Oh, good gracious. A pair of shoes. Oh, how sweet, how dainty. Uh, now, back to the little book. Uh, oh, my word. It's a diary. And the name embossed on the cover is plain as day. Gaston Donnet. Gaston. Gaston Jaunet. Monsieur Savinet? Come here immediately. Something wrong, Monsieur Savinet? An emergency. The Count is coming for dinner. It's his first visit to the Palais Savinet, and what do you think has happened? The head chef has had an accident, and he's in the hospital. Oh, what a pity. Well, you know who the Count is, don't you? Oh, I know, I know. What's to be done? There's nothing to be done but turn the whole thing over to you, Gaston. What? But I've been engaged as assistant chef. I don't have the capacity, the experience. My friend, I... there is no help for it. I'll tell you what. I'll give you Pierre all to yourself. Pierre? The scullery boy? Well, he's been with me for two whole years. Pierre? Come here. You'll see, Pierre is very knowledgeable. Yes, Monsieur Le Chauvenet. Pierre, my boy, who do you think will dine with us tonight? Hmm? The Count himself, friend to the king. But the head chef, he, he's at the hospital. Unhappily, but we must not let that affect us in the least. Monsieur Gaston Donnet here will be in charge. Oh. And you, Pierre, you are to leave everything else to others and devote yourself to him. Do you understand? I understand. Now... What shall we prepare for the Count, huh? Perhaps a, a, a leg of lamb, Eslington, with the proper vegetables? A Normandy sole before that. Oh, and, and, and for his particular pleasure, 
truffles served in the silver cocotte and wrapped in our finest linen napkin. Oh, the poor Gaston Donnet, poor chap. It's no small thing to prepare a superlative dinner for an important client. I know, I've wandered the world. I've been in Paris, ho, 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 more than once. Well, uh, let us read on in the diary what happens next. Ah, when the Count has eaten his dinner of truffles, of Normandy sole, of lamb Eslington, and all accompanied with the best wine, and all finished off with an exquisite plum brandy, what then... Success, success, Gaston. Oh, what a great success. I'm so happy, Monsieur Sylvie. He raved about the souffle. He was ecstatic over the leg of lamb. He all but, but kissed the vegetables. Oh, let the head chef stay in the hospital. You, you, Gaston Donnet, you are the best chef in all of Paris. Oh, Monsieur Sauvignet, surely not. Now listen, listen, dear chap. The Count intimated to me just before he departed, he plans to come back soon. It's too much. Now, that, 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 try your eyes ah. and get on home, because that's where I'm going. Pierre? Monsieur? You'll uh, close the place, won't you, so that our heroic friend here can go home? Yes, Monsieur Sauvignet. Then good night, my valiant Gaston. Good night until tomorrow. Good night. Oh, what a glorious night it has been. Aren't you going home, Monsieur Nene? What? Home? <laughs> to tell your wife about your success. I have no wife. Oh, there must be someone you can boast to. Monsieur Sauvignet said the Count adored the souffle and the lamb. All but kissed the vegetables, he said. But he said nothing about the truffles. <laughs> no, he didn't. The beautiful truffles in the silver cocotte. Pierre, did the Count enjoy the truffles, do you think? Well. If so, why didn't Monsieur Sauvignet mention it? Well, they were a little overcooked. Overcooked? You said overcooked? I heard the Count remark to his lady friend that they were slightly overdone. After all, they require only seven to eight minutes in the oven, and yours were in there for ten. That's not so. That's not so. Oh, yes, I noticed. At least ten minutes. Why, you dirty little beggar. Why, you... Okay. Keep, keep away from me. Keep away from sure me. Sure, that, that knife. No, the knife. Put down the knife. Felt. Please. Please. Felt. Felt. Oh. 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 You... You... You killed me. Piece of dirt. Nothing but a piece of dirt. Oh, absolutely incredible. Fantastic. Oh, my, I'm not at all sure I should let you hear this part. It's too, uh, too, uh, too, uh, uh, well, we've read this far together, and I know you're perishing to find out what comes next, so, all right. Gaston Donnet, as you've heard, stuck a kitchen knife right through Pierre's heart, and Pierre fell down dead. Then Gaston, appalled at what he'd done, dragged the boy's body into the little cuisine, and there he... Oh, there I tell you. Uh, there he removed Pierre's clothes and burned them in the small fireplace ordinarily used to incinerate discarded skin and feathers and uh, uh, other rubbish. Then he... Oh, this is fantastic. He, uh... Well, he dissected and dismembered the body and removed every last bit of flesh. And then... <laughs> really, this part is superb... He prepared the flesh in any number of ways. Marinated, stuffed, gratinated, minced, pickled, smoked. Oh, you do have to admire the man's ingenuity. Oh, say you do. Then the following day, there was such an outcry in the kitchen. Where is he? Where is that boy? Where is that good-for-nothing boy? That stone heaven's name, what's the matter? Stupid upstart. Pierre never showed up, Monsieur Sauvignet. I've waited all morning. I've searched the place. No sign of him. No word from him. Nothing. Yes, so calm yourself. What am I to do without a scullery boy? I shall find you a scullery boy. 
Within the hour, you shall have a scullery boy, and a good one, too. Because you know what? The Count is repeating his visit. The Count is? He's enamored of your cooking. Who knows? One day he might invite the king to be his guest. Would he come? Who knows? Now, what shall we serve the Count tonight, huh? Monsieur Sauvignet, is it true that the Count did not appreciate my truffles? I heard something to the effect... Oh, that was nothing. A trifle overcooked, he said, but it was nothing. Now... For this evening. First, uh, some scampi, perhaps? Leave the menu to me, monsieur. I shall prepare something... Something... Incomparable. Something new. You don't want to tell me what you have in mind. I want to work from my own inspiration, my own invention. I want it to be... A, a surprise. Oh, 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 I don't have to tell you, do I? That evening's repast was a mad success, a wild triumph, start to finish. Such fragrance, freshness, such combinations of flavors, eight courses, and each one better than the last. The Count and his dinner guests agreed to a man that never, never in their gastronomic lives had they enjoyed such a repast, and they sent a great storm of compliments to the genius chef. <laughs> oh, isn't it marvelous? Isn't it divine? For, of course, you know what they had eaten with such gusto. Oh, my dear Gaston, let me kiss you, both cheeks. Uh, oh, I kiss your hands. The Count and his friends enjoyed their dinner? Enjoyed. They were rapturous, Gaston. They were ecstatic. They were they were beside themselves. Ah, I'm so glad. And the new scullery boy, Francois, he, he served you well? Well enough. Francois's a good boy, but you, oh, you need no one but yourself and your incomparable talent. Ah, you're very kind. Yes, Tom. I cannot keep a secret. I must tell you. What secret is that? The Count is coming back. Oh? And this time, tomorrow or the night after, but certainly within the week, he hopes to bring a guest, a solitary guest. A lady? Oh, I think not. A gentleman, a high-born gentleman. The most noble gentleman of them all. What you mean? A royal gentleman, Gaston. Him? Of course, he will come disguised. It wouldn't do. Oh, just... no, no, of course not. No. And the Count wants you to prepare for this noble, this, this, uh, royal gentleman... The same dinner you prepared tonight. The same? The very same. Oh, my reputation is made. Just wait till everyone hears. Ah. Francois. Francois. Come here, my boy. Oh, and uh, bring the large mallet with you. The one we use to hammer out the scallops. Oh, yes. Yes, that's the one. Hand it over. Thank you, Francois. Now, turn around. And I'll face the other way. Yes. That's it. Now, stand very still. <coughs> I'm sorry, Francois. But what else could I do? say in the diary if the Count's guest was actually the king himself, although it does say that both gentlemen enjoyed that dinner immensely and sent the most effusive compliments to the chef. <laughs> However, according to what it says here, shortly thereafter, great outcries were raised by the mothers of the two vanished boys, and Gaston Donnet suddenly left Paris, never to return. <laughs> Which is quite understandable, wouldn't you say? Ready to continue? Be very sure, won't you? Because there's more to come. And if your heart stops or your hair turns white, don't blame me. I warned you, didn't I? Yes, I did. 
I told you from the very beginning. This is a horror story. Shall we proceed, sweet ladies, kind gentlemen? Remember, this tale has come down to us in the form of a legend built little by little by one storyteller after another. Each one delighted in what he had been told and then added whatever provocative details he thought might captivate his audience and seduce it into listening longer. That is, after all, how legends have come into being since the world began. Ready for the diary again, hmm? And for a change of scene? In 1829, New Orleans was already a fair city and a prosperous one. A proud and stylish and extremely forceful man, Mr. Poncet, was the leading citizen of New Orleans. And uh, into his office one day stepped a sturdy, aggressive man who looked to be about, oh, 50 years of age. Mr. Poncet, I believe. Ah, uh, the same, sir. And whom do I have the pleasure of addressing? Uh, my name is Ferro, sir. Lucien Ferro. Ah, a stranger to New Orleans? Well, not completely, sir. I have been plying my trade for some months. And your trade is? I am a shoemaker. Ah, 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 ah. You mend shoes, do you? No, I do not mend shoes, Mr. Poncet. I make shoes by hand. I cut every piece of leather. I sew every stitch with these two hands. I see. Well, now... What can I do for you, Mr. Farrow? Everyone tells me you are the most influential man in New Orleans. I want to buy that building on Common Street. Uh, which one do you have your eye on? The one with three stories, six chimneys. It's the only one vacant at present. And you want to move your shoemaking enterprise into that building? I do, sir. Isn't it a bit large? Three floors? Oh, one floor. The first one will suffice for my workroom. The third floor, that will be my home. I have walked through it. The light is wonderful. And the exquisite fireplaces in every room. Uh, but do you need so many rooms, a man living alone? Ah, but I shall not be living alone. I got married yesterday. Did you now? Well, that's splendid. <laughs> Congratulations. As soon as Camille said yes, I made up my mind that the building on Common Street must be mine. Uh, you, you're married? I, uh, alas, uh, I am a widower. But my beloved wife blessed me with a daughter, my angelic Monique, who is more precious to me than all the world's treasure. Now, of course. How old is Monique? Seventeen in a few months. <laughs> Soon she will make her debut. Oh, how splendid. It will be splendid, I promise you that, sir. I'm willing to spend half of all I've got to see that she's introduced to society in the grand style. Perhaps, uh, perhaps when she has chosen her gown and had it made, perhaps... You would come to me for the shoes? <laughs> Perhaps I shall. Uh, by the way, Ferro, what do you uh, propose to do with the second floor? You'll have your little shop on the first, you'll have your living quarters on the third, but uh, what about the second? What, what'll you do with that? Oh, I'll find a use for it. Things are settling down. Quite a prosaic little diary, after all. There are lots of mundane details I won't bother to pass on to you, all about Pharaoh fixing up the top floor, this very floor which I stand on now, and moving in with his rather uh, colorless wife, Camille. Grandiose claims of how his shoemaking industry flourished. A lot of petty boasting that you wouldn't be interested in. But now... Ah, yes. Here it starts to get interesting again. <laughs> you like this part, I think. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Oh, uh, I was looking for Mr. Lucian Farrow. Is he here? He's gone out on an errand. But he will be back. He didn't say when. Oh. I, uh, 
I wanted to ask him to make something for me, something very special for my daughter, Monique Ponce. <laughs> You, uh, you, you work here for Mr. Faroe? I'm his wife. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I haven't had the pleasure. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Faroe, are you enjoying your new home? It's very nice. Your husband's fame is spreading, you know, all over New Orleans. So he tells me. Everyone says his slippers are the softest, the most pliable, so flexible. <laughs> the ladies who worn them say they can dance all night and on into the morning. So I've heard. I'll tell you why I'm here, Mrs. Farrow. I, I wanted to order a pair of his wonderful slippers for my daughter, Monique. Uh, look here, I brought a swatch of the material, her... Dress is to be made from. My, my daughter has dark hair and dark eyes. Well, you can see, this is the material. Damask, isn't it? I believe that is what they call it. White damask, with just the faintest little thread of gold running through it. Beautiful. <gasps> Beautiful. Now, if uh, your husband can make shoes to match, <laughs> will he be back soon, do you think? I've got no way of knowing him. He never tells me anything. Oh, well, I'll, I'll wait a bit. Suit yourself. <clears throat> Tell me, uh, your husband has rented out the second floor, hasn't he? Yes, he has. To a restaurateur, I believe. A private dining salon, they say. So they say. Small, but uh, elegant. So I've heard. Oh, forgive me, Mrs. Farrow, but you, you talk as though you'd never seen it. I never have. Well, I am surprised. Your husband makes a, an excellent investment, and you you don't even care to see it? Oh, I care. It's grown famous all over New Orleans. The cuisine, everyone raves about it. So he tells me. But you have never dined there. Oh, no. Here's my husband now. Ah, uh, Mr. Ponce. Well, glad to see you, Mr. Pro. Mr. Ponce wants to order a pair of slippers. Oh, fine, fine. For Monique, for my daughter. I showed your wife the material her dress is being made from. You see, the, this is a small swatch. Very nice. I can get more if you'd care to make the slippers to match exactly. No. No, that wouldn't do it at all. Well, I simply thought... I have my own materials. Well, if, if you insist... I do insist. My materials are a thousand times more pliant than this damask. Oh, whatever you say, Pharaoh. Well, good day, Mrs. Pharaoh. Good day. How long was he here? Only a few minutes, Lucien. That's all. We chose to wait for you. What did you two talk about? Oh, your success for the most part. He mentioned the restaurant on the second floor. He asked if I'd ever dined there. He asked you that? Of course I said I hadn't. I said I'd never even set foot in the place. Why can't I see it, Lucien? Because I say you can't. But why can't I? I'd like to so much, Lucien. I've already told you why you can't. Because you say I can't. Precisely. I see. But I'd certainly like to. I'll hesitate to tell you what the next few pages of the diary hold. Oh, I don't think I can read on. Uh, yes, I must. If we're ever to finish this macabre tale. So I'll... Just tell you straight out. The secret material Pharaoh used for his extraordinary slippers was human skin. There, I've said it. And the source of his supply was the slave market. Oh, my word, what a really terrible fellow he was. Yet you do have to admire his enterprise and his courage in setting it all down here. You do have to respect that, don't you? Yes, sir? Do you have a reservation? Oh, I yes. The name is Ponce. Table for two. Ah, may I show you to your table, Mr. Ponce? <laughs> I suppose you might as well, but keep an eye out for my daughter, will you? We're dining together. She has dark hair, dark eyes, and she'll arrive alone. I'll watch for her and bring her to you. Ah, 
Here's your table. Can I order you an aperitif? Oh, no, thank you. Uh, I'll just wait for my daughter. As you wish, sir. My appetite has been whetted by what I've heard of your cuisine. I'm looking forward to... I beg your pardon. I think I see a lady alone. It could be your daughter. Ah, uh, Monique. Her name is Monique. Good evening, madame. You're expecting a gentleman? No, I'm by myself. I just wanted to see what it looks like. The management does not permit ladies unescorted. Are you the owner? I am the owner. Now, if you please... Lucien Ferro is my husband. He's your landlord. I cannot permit you to stay. He owns this entire building. It's his shoe shop on the first floor. I help him there sometimes. And we live on the third floor. But I've never set foot on this floor. And I thought Absolutely I'd... impossible. If I could just look in this one... Ah... Uh... On the other hand, come with me. I'll show you the whole place. Oh, it's, it's lovely. I'll show you everything. You're very kind. Through this door here, if you please. Is there another room? Yes. Through here. Oh, but... but Gone. Gone. But I, I don't... Uh, but this is the kitchen. It is the kitchen, and that is the back door. But I don't want... And you're leaving by the back door. No, I don't You're wa- leaving now. I don't want to leave. Now, Camille, this instant. You, you called me Camille. Oh. Oh, Lord. How do you know my name? Shut up, woman, shut up. Why? Lucia. It's you. What on earth have you done to yourself? Shut your mouth. But you look so young. You, you, you sound so young. You... Oh, you're quite different. You be quiet and get out, Camille, or you'll ruin me. What's the point of this masquerade? Why are you pretending to be two people? You're a fine shoemaker. Why do you have to be a chef as well? Why should I be one man when I can be two? But which is my husband? What is my name? You can't go on with this deception. You must stop. Never. Never. We shall be so rich, Camille. No. No. I won't go on this way. I can't. I don't know who I am, who you are. I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell everyone. You'll tell no one. Uh, no. do it? Why did you come here just when everything was going so well? Poor Camille, indeed. For her desperately ambitious husband strangled her right there in his own kitchen. And that... Oh, merciful heavens, I... I hate to tell you what comes next, but what it says here. As he looked around him, and the pots and the pans and all the accoutrements of his profession, the thought crossed his mind that... Oh, how can I say it? He, uh... He thought to himself, what a fabulous... What a fantastic dish I shall serve my customers tomorrow night. The strange, the weird, the grotesque, the bizarre. We so seldom encounter such things in our ordinary lives. They are confined to the world of fantasy, of fiction, of fable. And for my own part... I am perfectly content that such should be the case. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Back to our legend, which was invented to curdle your blood and freeze the marrow in your bones. If it has not done so, then it has failed in its purpose. For to make you gasp, exclaim, to make the hairs on your body stand on end, why, that is the very proper purpose of a horror story. Oh, 
I'm feeling better now. Able to read on, I think. There's a passage here that reveals what you must already have guessed. The proprietor of the restaurant on the second floor was not only Lucien Ferraud, he was likewise Gaston Donnet from Paris. <laughs> oh, dear me, how things have turned around in this world. It's enough to make one's head spin. Uh, well, anyway, the diary goes on quite calmly for a while, and then... Ah, Mr. Ferraud. Mr. Ponce, welcome to my little shop. <laughs> You're looking extremely well. Oh, thank you. I never felt better. And your charming wife, is she doing well? Satisfactorily, thank you. I'm uh, sorry not to see her. She's elsewhere. You know, it was to your wife that I first showed the little swatch of damask. She admired it so much. And I told her about Monique's debut. She seemed most interested. Yes, I'm sure she was. Oh, yes, we had nice little chat, nice little chat. We spoke of your tenant. My tenant? The man to whom you let the second floor. Oh, yes. And the restaurant that he opened... Why, it's become almost as famous in New Orleans as your delectable little slippers. Has it indeed? Yes. Well, shall I fetch the slippers, Mr. Ponce, uh, for your daughter? Ah, Monique slippers. Yes. Of course. That's what I came for. I have them right here. Here. Ah, here. Here they are. Oh, Mr. Ferraud. Oh, my friend. You like them? Like them? I have no words to convey what I feel. How white they are. How pure and white. Yes. Oh, they are like jewels. Royal jewels. I call them my masterpiece. <laughs> Has your wife seen them? Any? Uh, No. I haven't shown them to her. It'd be so nice if she were to come in right now. That is unlikely. Before I take them home? You might have a long wait. Yes, you're right. I must take them home and show them to Monique. God bless you, Faro, and give you continued success. <laughs> have you guessed it? Has your clever little mind penetrated the secret of Lucia Ferro's latest adventure? Have you succeeded in following the intricacies of his criminality? <laughs> if so, I don't have to tell you that the soft and subtle slippers which Mr. Ponce carried home in triumph were made of the white, young skin of Camille Ferro. Hello! Hello! Are you here? Where are you, you rogue? Come out here! <laughs> Mrs. Perot, are you here? I must see your husband at once. It is imperative. Well, I, I must see someone. I must see someone now. You were looking for oh, me? You villain, you monster. Something is wrong, sir. He, the devil. I, Mr. Ponce, for what... Or are you a sorcerer, a wizard? Mr. Ponce. Or do you have the I... evil eye? Confess, you barbarian. But what is it? What must I confess to? Oh, you know very well. No, I don't. Mr. Ponce, you left here an hour ago with the slippers. You seemed happy. The slippers, yes, yes, the slippers. You don't like the Those slippers? Those cursed slippers, the abominable your slippers. Your daughter does not like the slippers. There are your slippers. Uh, take them. You're bringing them back? You take them and never let me see them again. You don't want them. You unwrap them and you'll see. Unwrap them and see what you have created. Unwrap them and behold your masterpiece. I shall, I shall. Not in my presence, you won't. Wait till I'm out the door and never come near me again. What in the world? What went wrong? What? What's that? What, what's that sound? Can, can it be? Is it? Is it in here? Ah, ah, my, my slippers! My, my beautiful white slippers! What's, what's got into them? What, 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 what are you saying? Are you, are you mad? Wait, 
Wait, no, come back. Stay still. Where are you going? Hey, what, what, what's got into you? No, no, don't, don't touch me. Not me. Hey, not me, not me, not me. Stay away from me. Ah, I, I, I got scared. Hey, hey, what? They're following me. You will me if I can get to my own floor, my own place. Hey, um, one more floor. To, to the top. Hey, I'll, I'll hide. Yes, yes, yes. I'll hide. I'll, I'll hide here. Why? They're here. They got in. They're coming at me. Ah, they're on me. They're crawling up my back. Ah, my hair. On my face. Oh, no, they're sliding down my back. I, I, oh, good Lord. Oh, only rather they're on my diary. No one must ever see my diary. No one will ever know what I have done. If anyone is to know. Oh, no, no, no. Come for me. Ah, where can I hide it? So that, yeah, aha, ah, yes, yes. I'll hide it here behind this brick in the chimney. Yes, yes, here, here, here. Hide behind this brick. No one will ever find it. Aha, uh-huh. now, now, I, I just put back the brick. Oh, Lord! The slippers have skittered into the chimney. They're sitting on top of the diary. I, uh, well, at any rate, they're not chasing me. Well, I'll put back the brick now. Uh, a piece, a little piece. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. Uh, quiet. No noise. All quiet now. It's all very quiet. Uh, Come in. Where are you? Where, where have you gone, Kelly? Uh, and Francois. And Pierre. Oh. The police. They're here to get me. They're, they're going to arrest me. But, but what have I done? I haven't done anything. Just tried to make a living. Had little success. And I, I, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Dear friends and citizens, may I have your attention? I know you. I know you expect from me some explanation of what was found in the place on Common Street a few weeks back. The authorities have said that I might tell you all that is known. Though how it all came about is a matter for conjecture. When the police broke in on the third floor of the Common Street building, they found... uh, Be brave, my friends. Be prepared for something horrendous. They found a dead man. They think they recognized him as the owner of the building. Though, to be brutally honest... They could not be absolutely sure because the body, the body, good people, had been skinned. Yes, my friends, they have concluded that this poor man went mad and flayed himself alive. know what you're saying to yourself. Yes, I do. You're saying, how could he read all that last part in the diary? How could anybody have written it down with the slippers carrying on like that? It's impossible. Well, you're right. The reason I know what happened is that I am Gaston Donnet, later Lucien Ferro. That is to say, I am his astral, his uh, etherical body, vulgarly called a ghost. So I know all about it. Oh, and that banging at the door that poor Donet Ferro thought was the police? No, not so. It was two ordinary men who knocked. One wanted to buy the restaurant for an astronomical sum... The other had come all the way from Paris. 
A certain wealthy count had died and left a quantity of money to Gaston Donnet in memory of a marvelous meal he had cooked for the count some years before. All that work for nothing. Where did I go wrong? Well... It seems clear that there was a place on Common Street in New Orleans 150 years ago, and a man certainly did rent it and opened a shoe shop on the first floor and rented out the second floor for a restaurant and lived with his wife on the third floor and later died. And no doubt there was something strange about the man. But those are all the verifiable facts we have. As for the rest, well, you know how people talk. And as they talk, legends are born. And legends grow. And legends never die. I'll be back shortly. The horror story in modern literature started with The Castle of Otranto, written by Horace Walpole, quickly followed by The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Honore Balzac took up the form and improved on it in France. Bulwer Lytton rivaled him in England. And in America, it was brought to a peak by our own Edgar Allan Poe. Let's face it, the horror story is here to stay. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Mary Jane Higby, Ian Martin, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Secretary of State Vance continues his trip to the Middle East, trying to find a way to resolve the problems holding up a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Vance would like to see the treaty signed before the deadline of this Sunday, which was previously agreed upon. Before going on to Jerusalem, Vance met in Cairo with President Sadat. Bernard Kalb has a report. Their meeting lasted more than an hour. And Sadat, who usually enjoys his encounters with reporters, surprised everyone by declining to answer questions. So Vance soloed. He reported good progress without being specific. And he indicated that the U.S. and Egypt had discussed ways of getting around Sadat's insistence on rewriting a provision in the draft peace treaty, a rewrite resisted by Israel. Vance saying that he and Sadat were considering the possibility of interpretive notes or the exchange of letters on a number of items. As for whether the December 17th deadline can be met, Vance was characteristically cautious, saying that while he was not making any predictions, the effort should be made. Vance then flew to Israel specifically for Golda Meir's funeral, but his trip here can also be seen in the context of unofficial shuttle diplomacy. He had an opportunity to meet informally with Foreign Minister Dayan at the airport, possibly relaying Egypt's latest thinking on a peace package. Bernard Galb, CBS News, Jerusalem. More news in a moment. This is Johnny Carson. You got a lumpy head from being hit with too many appeals to the old wallet? Well, keep your hat on for this one. It won't hurt. Just a reminder that every day is a holiday someplace in the world. And there's a good excuse to send someone a greeting card. Holy day or holiday, your best bet for the greeting card is from UNICEF, United Nations Children's Fund. They've got the cards, terrific cards for every occasion. So send your donation to UNICEF, United Nations, New York, 10017. 
The State Department said Monday the United States continues to hope that the Shah of Iran can maintain authority and retain control of his government. But officials in Washington refuse to say whether they think the worst is over for the Shah. In Tehran Monday, an estimated two million anti-Shah demonstrators staged a generally peaceful rally against his rule. Violence was reported in two other Iranian cities with five people killed in one incident. In Boston Monday night, neurosurgery was performed on 83-year-old Arthur Fiedler, the famed Boston Pops conductor. Hospital officials say the operation was intended to correct problems which have been affecting Fiedler's mobility and gait. Henry Wilson, a spokesman for the Tufts New England Medical Center, had some information on the outcome of the surgery. Physicians report that Mr. Fiedler tolerated the procedure well and is now in the hospital's neurosurgical special care unit, where his condition is listed as fair. It will be several days before a full post-surgical evaluation can be made. Because of Fiedler's health problems, plans to televise his 84th birthday celebration on Sunday have been canceled. Explosions and fires were reported to have hit a storage depot used by four major oil companies near Salisbury, Rhodesia, Monday night. Spectators watching the huge flames said they believed black nationalist guerrillas were to blame. The U.S. dollar has fallen sharply in Tuesday morning's trading on the Tokyo Foreign Exchange. The dollar lost more than two and a half yen. The early morning armed robbery on Monday at New York's Kennedy Airport has turned out to be one of the largest in the nation's history. Mass gunmen burst into a Lufthansa Airlines cargo hangar and took about $3 million in cash, plus some gold and jewelry. Now this. Would you hire a person with epilepsy? Before you answer, consider this. Companies that do employ people with epilepsy say these employees often have better job performance, attendance, and safety records than non-handicapped workers. Employers also find that when employees are given the facts about epilepsy, they're most understanding. And even if a person has a seizure on the job, co-workers aren't alarmed. They're helpful. Accident insurance rates don't increase when you employ people with epilepsy. These rates aren't based on who's employed, but on the actual accident experience of the company and of similar companies in the area. Most types of epilepsy are controlled by medication. That's why people who've chosen not to reveal their condition can keep it hidden. Why hide? Well, that gets me back to the question. Would you hire a person with epilepsy? Epilepsy. It's not what you think. Get the facts. Contact your local epilepsy chapter or write Epilepsy Foundation of America, Washington, D.C., 20036. After setting attendance records at five other museums in the United States, the treasures of King Tutankhamun are about to go on display at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Some 3,000 journalists on Monday were given a press preview of the exhibit, which opens to the public next week, although tickets, which were provided some time ago, are long gone. King Tut had a brief reign in Egypt more than 3,000 years ago. Being displayed are some 55 magnificent gold and jeweled treasures from his tomb. Said one odd spectator Monday, it proves that you can take it with you. This is Doug Poling, CBS News.